All right. And I'm gonna use my uh, my laptop for the uh, PowerPoint and uh, um, and my phone for the uh, camera and microphone because I forgot my camera and this silly laptop does not have a a, a camera or a microphone, which makes no sense. It's, it's, I'm surprised it has a keyboard. So, <laughs> but uh, let's see. Yeah, we got 702, so we can we can go ahead and uh, begin. Um, I uh, uh, first wanted to start to make sure that everybody, uh, if anybody had any questions about arrival or any logistics, we could take care of those first. I think uh, Sarah Lee sent out the information on getting to the uh, to the village uh, earlier today and meeting you all are going to meet her at four o'clock over at lewis hall and then get settled in in the village and then come over to, to arlington house at uh quarter of six for dinner and dr jones i am not going to be there on sunday i'm going to be we're going to be driving back from upstate new york so but i think mary is going to be there okay mary will be okay. there so I'll join you all on, on Monday morning at the Visitor Center. So, well, cool. What we'll do, um, we're going to um, do uh, more formal introductions when we're at site. And uh, um, but what what I wanted to do tonight was do what we call our um, power replace uh, lecture, which is you know looking at um, the idea of power replace and putting what you all are going to be doing next week into a historical uh, community and a landscape context. And uh, when you um, when you think of power of place you know, something that the National Trust for Historic Preservation um, has been using for for many years now, and a lot of historic sites use it, but it's something that is can be very broadly defined. And uh, and at first, how is my? Um, can you all hear me? Okay. Do I need to shut off my camera and my phone? Sounds good. Okay. Good deal. But what what do you all think of when you think of uh, power of place, especially for a historic site? Like, what might that mean to you all? See Taylor stretching out to give an answer. <laughs> I, I guess just, you know, whatever activity it is, putting it in the proper context of the, the historical background uh, and legacy of the place where it's happening. Yeah, absolutely. It can be, um, you know, understanding uh, history from, you know, what, what the historical context is from, from, where, from where it happened. Uh, what else? Looks like Mike, you were going to say something. Well, when I think of power of place, I think it's it's the power to use a historic site as an opportunity to tell tell a story, uh, to have the the students connect with the story on the ground in which it took place. Mm -hmm. And what could you gain from being on the ground where something took place, where where um, history took place? Um, well, I know when I do Pickett's Charge at Gettysburg, I gained the understanding mm -hmm. that this was an impossible task when you walk across, across the field, uh, or it's just a, a connection. Uh, we have a, a, a very old uh, Afri uh, African-American cemetery on our campus, and mm -hmm. it, it's Jim Crow era. And so when we're talking about Jim Crow, it allows my students to connect with, you know, some real people that that endured the things that that we are discussing in class yeah yeah so it can be either the from the landscape perspective like you're talking about with pickett's charge i mean there's that part of the landscape that visceral part of the landscape the steepness of the slope the aspect of where you can see to and where you can't see that you don't get out of a book and with what you were mentioning about with the uh, um with the african-american cemetery from jim crow it's the the people is that, is that the perspective you're taking with that? Yeah, it, it's the people. It's 
It's uh, one of one of the the few marked graves we have is a World War One African American soldier that was mortally wounded in Meuse Argonne, and so being able to mm. tell his story wow. by his graveside in in the course of our study of the Jim Crow South and, and, and well into the 20th century, uh, you, you can tell that for the most part, the students sort of get it. Uh, mm -hmm. This idea mm -hmm. of I'm going to go serve and sacrifice what for, for rights and freedoms I'm being denied at home and you're doing it at his final resting place, which, which to me, I think it's a, is, is a powerful link to make. Yeah. Yeah. So it makes it, you know, real from the sense of uh, being a, having a, having it be a person that gives that power right. to that to that location. What, what else do you all think of? And there's obviously more than one answer for this. I think it is just it, it's kind of already been mentioned a couple of times, but making that personal connection because in the classroom what we deal with facts and numbers and uh, like you said from a textbook standpoint or a powerpoint standpoint or a lecture standpoint and actually seeing a place in it it just makes it more real um, and uh, again there's a lot of things that you would miss otherwise sure you can say it or talk about it but actually being there and experiencing it uh, just brings a whole new personalized level to it, it makes it um, more more easily connectable i guess yeah yeah and and having the um the ability to connect to a space from different perspectives you know whether it be the landscape the personal um or individuals uh because you know different individuals experienced it in very in very different ways and that's that's one thing uh with being you know being a being a site of enslavement uh, and being a president's home, uh, people get very different perspectives depending on what they bring to the visit, what they bring to their, you know, their experiences uh, give them in terms of understanding what this place might be. And for a place like Montpelier, what, what different perspectives do you think would be, we'd be offered to this? Uh, I know the last time I was at Montpelier, um, I'm a U.S. government teacher, so I was talking with the tour guide about the, um, the interesting, uh, you know, looking at Madison's constitutional role in writing the Bill of Rights and writing the Constitution and how it put forth all these ideas of freedom and, and things like that, yet at the same time that dichotomy of him also being a slave owner and how he kind of squared that away if he did it all. So kind of kind of looking at some of those glaring um, uh this this connections there and kind of figuring out you know how aware of it was he you know did he continue to do this uh and and kind of realizing what kind of effect that had on on everything else yeah yeah and i like how you put that as a dichotomy because it's uh some people talk about it as a contradiction but as we'll talk about tonight it was definitely not a kind of contradiction for madison i mean his the role he held as a slave owner combined with his being a political philosopher were one and the same. They both mutually influenced each other. And uh, the, one, the one thing we're really interested in Montpelier, we're interested in a lot of things, but one thing we're gonna talk about tonight is how the different, different roles that people had in the landscape influenced their perspective on this same set of spaces. And what we're, um, what we're working on right now, which we're really super excited about, is looking at the landscape from the standpoint of labor. You know, it's a plantation. You think of the main house that, you know, is Dolly and James Madison's home. Um, you think about the slave quarters that we've um, rebuilt. Uh, so the living areas. But then there's also those sites where enslaved Americans are labor and how to capture that to give another perspective on all of this, you know, uh, both the landscape, the history, like you were talking about Taylor with uh, 
with President Madison, his role in the in the in you know forming the Constitution. And so, what um, what we're going to have you all think about all next week is you know how what we learn about the landscape through archaeology radically influences how we see that landscape and how it changes the power of place. I mean, at you know you're going to be on Monday you're going to be looking at what appears to be a field with nothing on it. And by the end of the week, you're going to have a very intimate understanding of that space being a workspace, especially since you all are going to be excavating a blacksmith shop where you're going to be holding the products of, you know, enslaved individuals labor in a way that in often cases you can't do, you know, if you're looking at, say, uh, a, uh, um, a tobacco bar or, or a threshing bar, you know, those, those products are gone. Some of the tools are there, but um it's it's a it's a way to uh, experience what this plantation called Montpelier was, and also what we'll talk about today and, and also next week is bringing in uh, descendants' perspectives on this. Because in doing the research we're doing on the enslaved Americans at Montpelier, we're also we're getting an understanding of not only what um, enslaved lives are like, but also defining who those people were, and by defining who those people were, the descendants of those people have a very strong interest in what kind of history we're telling. And we're, y'all might have seen um, in recent news, we were entering a very unique, unique, unique relationship in terms of a historic home with the descendant community, in terms of having structural parity, meaning, meaning with the power of the board, half the board will be made up of descendants at Montpelier, and they will have you know decision-making power alongside the rest of the board over everything that we do. And th these, me, what this decision-making power entails is really having conversations, open conversations and very frank conversations about you know, what research we're doing and the kind of questions we're, we're asking and to broaden the perspective and what we you know, really determine you know, is being the power of place at, a, a, at Montpelier. So what, what I'll do is I will go ahead and uh, jump into uh, the lecture here. I'm thinking this will be about uh, 40 to 45 minutes uh, long, and and feel free at any moment to interrupt with any questions you might have. I'm going to try to pose questions to you all as well to, to keep it going. Um, and did you all have a chance to look at some of the background readings, like the archaeology booklet? Did you all get those and have a chance to go through those? Cool. Well, what um. What I'm going to do, let's see, I'll share screens here. And hopefully this will result in um, the entire screen from your all's standpoint being able to be seen. Let's see, can you all see the, um, yes. the uh, you can see the PowerPoint? OK, awesome. Yes, Sounds yes. good. <laughs> all right, awesome. Well. Um, what, uh, like I mentioned, what we're gonna, um, what we're looking at right now is the perspective of Montpelier, not just from the standpoint of the main house at Montpelier, but Montpelier from the standpoint of the house being situated within, you know, this larger 2,700 acre uh, property. So you can see where my arrow is, the main house is right here, and it's exactly in the middle of this 2,650 acre land mass that it makes up Montpelier. And what we're interested doing in doing is understanding all of the sites on this landscape and how you know they're influenced by you know the the economic motivations of James Madison, but the, and also you know the three generations of Madisons that own the land, but then also the the enslaved Americans that made up the working uh, uh, work, workers uh, workers of Montpelier and more importantly the community of Montpelier for uh, close to 140, 150 years. And when you look at the numbers of people that were at Montpelier at any one time, there were over 110 enslaved Americans at Montpelier from the period of the 1780s up until the 1840s when Dolly Madison sold the property and all the community at that time. And so you're looking at you know, 95% of the people, over 95% of the people were enslaved as compared to, you know, whether it was um, the, the White Madison family or the overseer and their family that was at, at Montpelier. So when you look at the sites that we 
you know, we've been excavating over the past 20 years. The majority of them are uh, sites where enslaved Americans were living. This is everything from, and we'll get into much more detail on this, you know, tonight, but also when you do your tours next week, uh, the South Yard, which is the quarters for house slaves. Uh, there, you know, for those excavations, not only have we have done complete excavations in those spaces, but we've reconstructed the, uh, the homes of the enslaved domestics that were uh, lived and worked at Montpelier. And also we've done the same thing for, um, for the uh, enslaved uh, laborers who worked out at the home farm. And this is the area we're working on right now. You can see in this picture, the visitor center in the background, this is a shot from around 2011, where we were excavating the, um, the remains of the, the houses that were there. And this is one of these subfloor pits. I'll go into it in, in a little more detail in a few minutes. But we've actually brought those buildings back. And the, really the point of bringing these living spaces back is to bring the lives of the enslaved back. And along with discovering their homes, we've also located you know, the household items that the enslaved Americans would have had in, you know, would have been purchasing and used in these spaces, everything from ceramics to glasswares to um, even tobacco pipe, uh, uh, tobacco pipes that were both imported and some were locally made. But this is the, these are the sites that you generally see when you visit a plantation, you know, a plantation that's interpreted today, not just the main house, but the quarters. But what often is not interpreted is the spaces where the labor happened. And this is everything from you know, storage sheds to, uh, to granaries uh, included in the buildings are uh, stables, tobacco barns, blacksmith shops, all these sites that made a plantation basically a labor camp, a forced labor camp. And in addition to that, you've got the uh, sites that were, where crops are processed in the fields and even the fields themselves. And in really understanding what Montpelier is. I mean, it's these work sites that made Montpelier profitable enough to have, to allow James Madison to pursue his polit political pursuits. And, you know, what, what do you think we'd be able to we gain from, you know, looking at these sites of labor? You know, what are some of the aspects of that that you wouldn't get if you were just looking at some of the, you know, some of the habitations? And anybody can jump in on this. I see Chance, you were looking, uh, looking pensive. What do you think you can get from these sites of labor? Well, and I mean, since they are going to typically be at these sites far more often than they would at uh, their dwellings, you know, I think that that, that in, of, in and of itself is going to lend um, probably more information about their lives, what they experienced, what they were going through, the hardships, um, and, and all those other aspects that you would otherwise miss, or, or at least most of it you would miss if you just focused on uh, their housing. Absolutely. And this is, you know, in being at these sites, this is the, looking at these sites is something that the Senate community asked us to do with the restoration of the South Yard is to do just what you were talking about, Chance, is to think about the, um, the motivation, motivations and what would have really um, fi fired the agenda for the enslaved community. Because when you think about Madison, you know, there's, you know, when, even when we, we tour visitors through the house and we're talking about Madison, we're talking not just about how he was entertaining, how he was living with Dolly. We're talking about his political career, what he did, you know, in terms of um, establishing the um, the basis for the for the Constitution, his early political life, and if you ignored the the daily lives, the daily labor the, ens the enslaved are going through, you're going to miss all those aspects that you were mentioning, Chance. Which is what are the motiv motivating factors for, say, um, you know, an individual laboring in the field? You know, what are what are what are going to be some of the things that they would have chosen for innovations in agriculture? Maybe, maybe to make their work days shorter so that they would be able to successfully complete the tasks they were assigned and then have the energy, maybe not the time, but the energy to pursue their own gardening, their own uh, household production. And so that's getting into what descendants have asked us to do is to think about in, in many ways, the intellectual lives of their ancestors, which is how are they formulating these ideas of 
liberty that they hear every day, you know, with conversations that are happening at the main house in front of them because they're serving the table and they're hearing these, these conversations. How are they incorporating that into their lives? And this is something that by studying these sites of labor, we've got an opportunity to do. And it also makes it a lot more uh, a way to talk about this with visitors that you wouldn't be able to do if you didn't have these sites to present to, to the public. So, you know, for us at Montpelier, it gets into what, you know, we, we often talk about with full scale restoration and people think about, oh, restoring the house. But, you know, once we restored the house in 2008, we realized it was set on this 20th century landscape. And there is, you know, we found all these sites that need to be brought back. And so full scale restoration is all 2,650 acres. I mean, we're probably not gonna restore every last barn that was there, but we wanna know what sites are there so we can incorporate that into the story. The other thing that you'll learn more about on, on early next week is we have a profound lack of documentary records. There was a, um, in the 1840s or 1850s when uh, John Payne Todd, the stepson dies, all of the family papers were found at his house and James Madison's nieces and nephews found literally two rooms full of documents and decide to haul all these documents out to the back lawn and put a match to them to burn them. And with that went, yeah, Taylor, you're gritting your, your, uh, your, your, your fists there. Yeah, with that went, you know, not only where, you know, maps where the fields were, what the crop yields were from the garden books, but so much of the evidence of the labor of the enslaved community and also a lot of their personal history, the names. And so with the burning of those records, what we think that Madison's nieces and nephews were trying to do is get rid of those personal aspects of, of their uncle's life that might've been seen is more distasteful for his legacy. So, you know, what, you know, claiming that it was his privacy they were protecting, it was, you know, in some ways his legacy as well. And so uh, being able to get, removing those documents, what we're at the stand, what we're at the standpoint to be able to do with the archeology span and how well preserved Montpelier is, is to really reconstruct what happened at Montpelier in terms of the labor, in terms of the contributions of African-Americans enslaved Americans at Montpelier. And so, this is where uh, we've got a we've got such incredible preservation of the archaeology record at Montpelier, combined with this lack of documentary records, that it gives us a real opportunity to have these sites bear witness to you know a, a very hidden aspect of the lives of the enslaved at Montpelier. And so, what um, we've got with the history of Montpelier, we want to go over in a really quick nutshell, is. During the period of Madison ownership from the 1720s through the 1840s, this is where you just have an incredible assemblage of sites that's built up because you have over 100 individuals who are enslaved at Montpelier, over, over about 300 that were um, lived and worked and died at Montpelier. So you just have sites galore. And we've done surveys. What we found is we found hundreds of sites of you know, buildings, of labor, of, of living sites and once the property was sold by Dolly Madison in 1844, most of the most, if not all these sites were abandoned. And for the next 200, two centuries, you really get some amazing preservation at Montpelier. And we'll go into some of the details on this. But after the Civil War, you, the, um, the number of enslaved individuals goes down to about 25. So a lot of the work sites are abandoned. And up until the early 20th century, there's not a lot of... Uh, use of the land. So a lot of these fields and work areas returned to woods. And then during the 20th century, when you could have had, you know, pretty um, uh, rapid destruction of sites through plowing, through mechanized plowing, the DuPont, DuPonts own the property. And they don't need to make a couple hundred dollars off the fields or cut the woods for, um, for timber money. They basically run it as a hobby farm, essentially, for from 1901 all the way up until 1984. And then during the National Trust ownership, ironically, it's during that time where Montpelier really witnesses some of the greatest impact on resources through logging that the National Trust does and some of the early restoration work that happens at the main house. And so fortunately, if you hadn't heard of Montpelier before 2000, it's because it was kind of in a state of being in mothballs. So not a lot happened as much as could have if you know, Montpelier began to be interpreted in the 1920s, like what happened at Monticello and Mount Vernon. So really, we've got 200 years of preservation at Montpelier that allows us to understand through the archaeology 
what happened during the Madison ownership. And what for the for this for this landscape, what we've got at Montpelier is about 1800 acres of woods. And the visitor core is a very small part of the rest of this, you know, uh, 2700 acre landmass. And when you look at um, what was originally Madison lands, the area that's in yellow here, the slight shade of yellow, this is what was owned by the Madison family in the 18th and in, up until the mid 19th century. And there's other adjacent plantation land that's on within the white boundary that's owned by the National Trust for Historic Preservation today. But most of the land makes up the, is, is the Montpelier plantation core. And of this land, we've got about 1800 acres of it that's in woods. And if you were at Montpelier around 1810, there probably would have only been about four, 400 acres of woods. So we've just got massive areas of fields that have grown back up into woods. And um, I've, I've sent you all um, some uh, uh, story maps that talk about the plantation below the canopy, which is you know these plantation evidence for plantation fields that we found within the woodlots of Montpelier. And that's become a really, it's probably going to be like the next decade of work we're going to do after we finish the project that we're working with you all on next week. But there are just dozens of sites out there that we're locating through metal detector survey. And the metal detector surveys that we've done at Montpelier, we've located uh, most of the sites that we've located to date are uh, Civil War encampments. But we're starting through metal detector surveys, and I'll get into this in a few minutes, but we started to locate these smaller sites that are these smaller circles. These are these sites that are really difficult to find and often can only be found through very intensive metal detector surveys where we survey the property on uh, basically a tenth of an acre grid to make sure we locate every cluster of nails that represent barns and other work areas on the property. And I'll get into that in a few minutes. But what we've um, come away with, with understanding is really getting a sense of how under the three generations of Mad Madison ownership, there are very different ways that the land was being worked um, in terms of the agricultural enterprise. And this gets into um, uh, uh, understanding the, the Madisons from the 1720s when it was the uh, Madison's grandmother that ran Montpelier, this is Francis Madison. And she was running Montpelier as a basically a, as a tobacco plantation, and she was a, a planter, and she um, was a lot. She ran Montpelier from 1732 up until her death in 1761. And you'll learn more about Frances Madison, the grandmother, with um, when when uh, uh, Sarah Lee uh, Hall gives you a tour of the uh, the landscape. But when she becomes a widow in 1732. It's two of um, her slaves and a, and, a, and a neighboring slave poisoned her husband. This is James Madison's grandfather, Ambrose Madison. He's dead by 1732. She is running the plantation as a widow. And when her son, James Madison Sr., comes of age in 1740, she has another 20 years of running the plantation and basically running the tobacco uh, cultivation part of this, uh, of, the, of the plantation. And what this means is that her son starts to engage in other activities. He starts to, he sets up a blacksmith shop with enslaved blacksmiths. He imports goods from uh, England and sets up a mercantile shop at Montpelier. He serves the, the local, um, basically sells items to the local uh, community, which brings in pretty much double the wealth from tobacco. And when you get into the 18th century with the Revolu American Revolution, when the tobacco market falls, the bottom falls out of it, Montpelier is really able to continue to run at a profit all the way through the 1780s. And this allows James Madison Jr., this is the grandson of Francis Madison, to pursue his political career in a way that he never would have if you know, some of these changes hadn't taken place. So through 1761, Montpelier is mainly being run as a, uh, um, as a tobacco farm there, you know, Francis Madison is uh, managing the tobacco cultivation of the property and marketing it under, under, under her name. After she passes away, this is when um, uh, James Madison Jr., he would have been about 10 years old at this time, he would have grown up not at Mount Pleasant, which is a site nearby that we're going to be excavating um, uh, next week, but he grew up in a very small house up where the main house is. So for years, we thought Madison grew up at Mount Pleasant, which is over by the Madison Family Cemetery. 
turns out from excavations we did about six years ago, we found what we thought was a, um, a, uh, um, a kitchen, this building right here, that turns out it was an early planner's cottage, which was James Madison's parents newlywed, basically their honeymoon cottage that they lived in for 10 years. It was a 16 by 20 building where James Madison spent the first 10 years of his life. And it wasn't until Francis Madison, the grandmother dies, that the main house that's built by 1765 starts to be built. So what you get is this really uh, interesting early history that Madison as a child is witnessing where you've got the plantation being run by two different generations, the grandmother's grandmother and then the parents. And this really influences who Madison was as a person in terms of, you know, seeing, you know, being raised on a plantation that was um, that was a matriarchy and um, the um, his parents begin to um, to do you know, very different things than you'd expect in the plantation, which is, you know, having a major blacksmith shop that would be you know, selling things to the local community. But by the 1760s, that's when the brick main house is completed. And during that time, this is when James Madison's uh, parents begin to engage in more, uh, have, they, have their slave in, engage in more plow-based agriculture, where they're having, at the blacksmith shop, they're building plows, some of the earliest plows in the Virginia Piedmont. And instead of doing the slash and burn horticulture that occurs with tobacco, they're, they're having the enslaved laborers at Montpelier clan clear much larger areas of, uh, of fields for plowing and begin to um, plant wheat and grains, which substantially increases the wealth of you know, the income that's coming in at Montpelier. And this goes on all the way up until uh, the eight, about the 1790s when James Madison Jr., the future president, takes over the operation of the plantation. And at that time, that's when he start, he and Dolly uh, marry and they start making changes to the house. This is when this duplex addition is added onto the house. You'll notice, you know, in the 18th century, the house is this, you know, relatively large brick main house. But by 1797, there's a duplex added on the north side of the house along with the front portico. And then when they make plans for um, retiring for the, from the presidency in the 18 teens, they substantially enlarge the house with, uh, with these one-story wings that have make the house appear as it is today. But during the 1790s, what James Madison Jr. begins doing is changing the operation, the farming operations of the estate over to a more scientific farming. And so what he does is essentially uh, gets rid of the blacksmith shop. It, it used to be up by the main house and it gets moved out to the farm complex where we're excavating the early 19th century blacksmith shop um, uh, this year, where you're gonna be excavating next week. And so he removes a lot of the, um, a lot of the uh, quasi industrial labor that was happening near the main house out to the farm complex and really gets rid of the role that Montpelier had on su supplying items to the local community and basically kills the economy of the plantation. And this is where Montpelier starts to go into debt because they don't, they're not, you know, the, because of the sales of agriculture in the Virginia at, the, at this time period, they're not able to turn profit from the agricultural enterprises at Montpelier. And what Montpelier, what, what Montpelier turns into during the retirement years, starting in the 18 teens, is more about producing uh, enslaved individuals that can be sold. And starting in the 1820s, it, this happens where field workers of prime age begin to be sold to the deep south. And essentially, Mont Montpelier gets stirred into a breeding plantation. When you look at the population tree of Montpelier in the 1820s, over 50% of the individuals living at Montpelier who are enslaved are under 12 years old. And what this gives ev evidence for is what Madison writes about his nieces and nephews who are basically turning their plantations into breeding farms for selling slaves through Richmond down into the deep south. And this is what happens at so many plantations in Virginia, Maryland, and also in North Carolina, where these older uh, Virginia and, um, uh, and uh, Chesapeake plantations basically become breeding plantations for the New South where cotton is being produced. So when you look at what the value of items that are being produced at Montpelier, it's all about people rather than agricultural crops. 
And so when you look at, you know, the whole idea of, you know, people always ask the question, you know, when Madison died, did he free his slaves? And there's, you know, historians that have written about years that Madison had a desire to free his slaves, but, you know, we know from the records he did not. Um, a lot of those desires that are talked about are based on assumptions that, you know, with James Madison being the father of the Constitution, the, the architect of the Bill of the Rights, this would have been a desire that he had. But underlying what those documents are is who would have been a citizen if you were at Montpelier, say, in 1810. And what were some of the three characteristics of, you know, being an American citizen in 1810? Oh, I think you're muted, Taylor. Maybe, I, can you all hear Taylor? Okay, I was worried my, my headphones are gone, so. Everybody's putting it in the chat. <laughs> oh, everybody's putting it in the chat. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Alex. No worries. Let me bring the, the chat up here. Awesome. Yeah, white male and landowner. And uh, um, Bashir, you asked breeding farms with 12 year olds. Yeah, it's when you look at um, uh, some of the things that the Madison, Madison and Jefferson write about, one of the things that's that's often quoted by uh, tour guides is, you know, how well slaves were treated at plantations such as Montpelier, where the Jefferson and Madison write letters to the overseers instructing them not to whip slaves. And that can be interpreted many ways. You know, in some cases, it's interpreted as, you know, treating enslaved Americans well. But when you look at the economic motivations for that, you know, if you're an enslaved individual and you have scars in your back from being whipped, what do you think that's going to do to your resale value at the auction block? Yeah, it's going to it's going to lower. It. I mean, it's it's pretty sobering. And this is where when you look at what um, how Jefferson, you know, President Jefferson and former President Madison recover their debt, recover their debts is by selling the enslaved community uh, upon their death. And for Madison, this would have been very personal because one, he knew that if uh, the institution of slavery was threatened, a lot of his fellow Virginians, South Carolinians are gonna see that the gig is up on slavery and the nation is gonna be divided. And even in, in his own personal life, he knew that if he freed his slaves, he was he was gonna be basically um, uh, you know, subjecting Dolly his, the, when she became a widow to debtor's prison. I mean, she was already in debt after selling the, the uh, enslaved community, but without the sale from the enslaved community, those debts would have been insurmountable. I mean, there would have been some pretty uh, radical uh, um, impacts that you know his own his own wife would have had. So this was you know very personal and, and really very much real for for Madison. But um, but yeah, for the the ideals of citizenship, I mean, those were bestowed upon. Uh, white males with property, and that was, you know, intentional. That um, that uh, any you know people of color, if you're a black person and you're in Richmond, you had to show your papers that you were free, prove that you were free. Otherwise, you could be arrested, put in jail, and then sold. So, having skin color attached to uh, basically assigning people to property was a central tenet of you know, the, the economy of the time period. And this is something that, you know, all the constitution, the bill of rights in many ways is designed to protect land owners to keep their property. So, so when Ma the Madison sell the property in 1844, when Dolly sells the property in 1844, this is when basically all the community is sold. And um, by the time you get to uh, the 1840s, so many of the community are sold that basically all the buildings at Montpelier by 1844 are torn down. And when you look at the property in 1848, basically all the buildings except for the main house are the only ones that are left. And the rest are basically from the main house uh, south past the visitor center to where we're working next week. All those buildings are removed from the landscape. 
And what it means is that these sites are never developed. And what happens in the, um, the 18, late 1840s is where the old farm complex used to be in this map of Montpelier, the area in red, all that gets moved to the north part of the property where you all are staying in the village. That becomes the new farm complex and all this area is abandoned. So where we're gonna be working next week is down in this area and basically everything throughout this area, what today is the visitor core, the historic core of Montpelier is pretty much abandoned by 1844, except for the main house and remains untouched up until today. And so this, it's just this incredible space to learn about, you know, what this plantation looked like through the archeology. span So um, what some of the sites you're all gonna be looking at when you're visiting Montpelier is uh, after the Madison sell the property, Really, the main occupation that happens that develops the, the, the next greatest number of sites are these Civil War encampments, these Confederate encampments that are developed all across the property. This is Montpelier is occupied by Confederate troops after the Battle of Gettysburg, but before the Battle of Wilderness. And at any one time from August of 1863 through May of 1864, you've got about 1,200 Confederate troops camped at Montpelier. And one thing that really makes this uh, special for us is that it allows us to talk about what happened at Montpelier during the Civil War, which any visitor come to visit a Virginia historic site always asks. But it's also really the legacy of the Constitution and the legacy of Montpelier. And it's a way, or the legacy of Madison, and it's a way to talk about, you know, how slavery was resolved through not just the Civil War, but through the amendment system of the Constitution, but then go, go further than that and get into the Jim Crow era, get into um, uh, the civil rights legislation of the 1960s, and really begin to flesh out how the Constitution, you know, fails in some areas, but is able to succeed in changing as a document and really remain the same document that's carried this country through a series of radical changes, but to use the power of place, the power of these sites to talk about these changes. And so, you know, we're, what we're able to do at Montpelier is talk about constitutional theory, not from the standpoint of what, you know, you all are teaching in, say, if you're teaching civics or constitutional theory, but from real people's lives. And to really get into what visitors want to know about, which is the daily lives of, you know, people that lived at Montpelier and have, you know, go out and witness where some of these sites are. So, after the so you you all are going to see some of these encampments, especially the encampments on the northern part of the property. Uh, one of our staff, Chris, is going to be taking to you out on a tour of those one of the the mornings next week, and so you'll be able to see some of the reconstructed huts that are out there. But then also get into you know some of the um, of the of the uh, the legacy of the this you know Confederate history that is is still with us today and and uh, bears witness to the to the Jim Crow era that extends you know, into the 20th century. For the house though, the house, you know, has a lot of changes through the 19th century. Um, and during this time period, a lot of the older uh, slave quarters are abandoned, but we do have in the late 19th century, we've got several sites that are where former slaves who were enslaved at Montpelier build homesteads and farmsteads in the, in the uh, late 19th century. And one of these is the Gilmore cabin that we interpret today in its 1880s um, uh, used by the Gilmore family. And you all will be taking a tour of that as well uh, next week. And for the main house, um, when you get into the 20th century, this is where you know, some of the biggest changes have happened at Montpelier. And did, it, has, did any of you all, have any of you all, did you, any of you all visit Montpelier before the restoration? Let's see, I lost my, uh, uh, chat here, but um, <laughs> but if you visited Montpelier before um, before uh, let's see, there's the chat. I'll keep this up here. Okay, uh, no. So <laughs> if you visited Montpelier before 2004, this is the building that you would have seen. It was a um, a large 20th century structure, and basically what we did was go through a. Um, let me move this chat out of the way because I don't know if the, oops. Uh, go through a, a, eight, a, a six year restoration where we removed all of the DuPont wings and brought it back to 
its early 19th century appearance. And with the restoration of the house, when it was just about completed in 2006, like I mentioned, this is when we realized that the landscape it sat on was this amalgamation of late 19th and early 20th century um, landscapes. And we wanted to really bring back this, its early 19th century appearance. So that's where, you know, looking at historical documents, we knew the front of the house looked very different. 2006, we do, started doing excavations on this front landscape and found evidence for the front fence that basically went all the way up across the front of the house and was also accompanied by a carriage road where we not only do we find the remains of the post holes, these are the archeological features where enslaved laborers dug holes to put the post in. And in this picture right here, you can see where the, the post is marked by the A, that's the charred remains of the post from the front fence. The enslaved workers charred the outside of the post to harden it from insect infestation so it would it preserve better in the ground. And so we're able to define where the post is within this hole that was dug. And these are the kind of the features you all are going to be looking for next week to understand, you know, the layout of the site, you know, around the blacksmith shop. But for the front fence, what it allowed us to do is to figure out where this fence was that's shown in this 1818 watercolor. And then also where the road was, where this enslaved mother and her child were walking in front of the house, we actually found the last set of wagon ruts buried under about a foot of clay. And what we're able to do is take this archaeological data and bring back the landscape to you know how it's restored today with the front fence and the uh, the, ro the road uh, landscape and what we've done is not only use this to restore the landscape but create these computer generated um uh, uh images of what we think the landscape looked like in the early 19th century and so what we found from the the work we've done over the past Gosh, 15, 18 years around the main house is not only information about the formal grounds around the main house. And when Sarah Lee gives you the tour of the main house, she'll talk about much of this. But a lot of the, the teacher programs that, doc, that um, Dr. Jones has run with us over the past five or six, seven years have explored a lot of these sites. Everything from, you know, work we did in the Pine Alley and the, um, and the, uh, the temple to the grove. And we've, you know, not only figured out where the 18th century buildings are in these areas, but what the planted landscape looked like and how they, these plants directed the view towards the main house, but also evidence for you know, this larger enclosure that included a trash deposit outside of the formal grounds of the main house. And this week, this week hopefully you'll be finding some of these ceramics that even show up all the way out of the blacksmith shop, especially the, the, this bamboo and peony ceramic. This is one that we've actually found at the blacksmith shop at the, the field quarters. This was a set of china that the Madisons used in their dining room during their retirement years and really has shown us how you know the community is defined in the antebellum period and the postbellum period as field slaves and house slaves that don't interact is absolutely ludicrous when you look at how communities would have been operating. And uh, Mary will talk more about this in her ceramics lecture um, on Monday. But the, the very fact that we find, you know, the, the Madison's dining room wares all across the plantation shows that when these items are broken, that they're being thrown out, you know, in ways to get rid of the evidence, the breakage all across the plantation. And, you know, that gets into not just how slaves are managing to, you know, avoid being punished by Dolly Madison, who is the hostess with the most just if you're a guest, but maybe not so if you're an enslaved individual, obviously, but how the community interactions would have been working. Um, other areas that you'll explore next week are the back lawn that was this large level area that was manufactured by, by slaves in the early 19th, early 20th century, along with a formal uh, garden that's this massive series of terraces that really speaks to the amount of landscaping that slaves engaged in to create this uh, this platform for entertaining that the Madisons use in the um, 1820s and 30s when they were retired at Montpelier. But in the middle of all this, what we've got is the quarters for house slaves, the South Yard, that we'll talk a little bit more about just right now. This space is one that um, we knew about from an insurance plat. And about 10 years ago, we did excavations and found evidence for buildings here they were well enough preserved from the archaeology that we were able to begin to understand we could reconstruct this landscape and we did this at the bequest of the of the descendant community who after we restored the main house 
really saw the next opportunity was to bring the evidence that we found from the archaeology of their ancestors' daily lives right next to the main house to life. And so over the past five years, what we've done is archaeology in this space of finding the evidence for the smoke houses for what turns out to be this early um, uh, 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 dwelling house that was the Madison's childhood home, then later on the kitchen, but then also the another building over here, which is an 18th century building, bring do the archaeology on this space to begin to bring these buildings back to the landscape. And part of this reconstruction, we involved the descendant community in not just the research, but also the interpretation of these spaces. And this is where we developed an exhibit called The Mere Distinction of Color, where instead of just pre presenting these spaces as, you know, these what look to be uh, almost refined cottages, but to bring the perspective of the enslaved into and what they would have been experiencing in this space as compared to what was going on in the main house with you know, some of the ideas of, of individual liberty that were being espoused by Madison, put all this into one context and really look at how the yet what the intersection between race, slavery, and the constitution, what that meant for the, the enslaved at Montpelier. And this it developed into an exhibit where we crowdsourced the uh, this exhibit with the descendant community to really have the descendants tell their perspective on what the Constitution means to them as descendants of the enslaved at Montpelier. And this, this exhibit we're going to have open for you all next week to really experience this larger, you know, uh, historical context of Montpelier, but then also how all these reconstructed buildings can be used as a place to tell this larger story. And how, when you bring in the descendants into this story, how that changes the perspective from just, you know, doing, doing a traditional plantation perspective where slaves, the enslaved community are being presented for their labor and the owners are presented from, you know, providing the under, economic underpinnings of the plantation. And so what, um, what we're doing now with the archaeology is getting beyond the main house, but looking at you know, this, this larger landscape perspective. And this is where, uh, when you look at Montpelier today, where visitors, where, they, where you park your car today, what you see is not the main house up in this wooded area here, but this large open field, which turns out this was the main farm complex in the early 19th century. So if you were to look at this space as it appeared in the early 19th century, this would have been a virtual, you know, uh, work work village of the time period with multiple barns, uh, you know, everything from threshing barns to tobacco barns to stables, the blacksmith shop, and, and the uh, living quarters for the enslaved individuals who lived and worked in this space. And what we're doing with this space is using the archaeology to really understand what's there. And a big part of this archaeology has involved not just standard excavation techniques and units, but also the metal detector surveys that I was mentioning. And what Terry on Monday morning, he's gonna give you all a tour of all this space. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give a kind of a light coverage of this. And we're already at 7.54 and I don't wanna keep, keep, keep you all night in some, with the, uh, the background lecture here. But the, the one perspective Terry can't give you is this 2,700 acre perspective because he can't take you all up in a hot air balloon to see the, the entire property when he when you all are at the uh, the visitor center on Monday. But the um the area that you see in red, this is the 2650 acres that make up Montpelier today. The area that's in these little squares, the green, the yellow, and the red squares, these are areas where we've done metal detector surveys. And um let me see you get I'm going to reduce you all. So I'm, I'm not sure if your all's picture shows up in your all in your all screen. Actually, it doesn't. That's great. I can see you on my phone. What it looks like. But what we've been doing with the uh, with the metal detector surveys is what we've figured out about these plantations is to find the sites. You can't use a predictive model. You basically have to cover every inch of the ground to find where the uh, not just where the slave quarters are, but the, where the barns and working areas are. And so what we do is we lay out a grid using GP, uh, GPS devices and lay out the grid on a, on a uh, 20 meter interval, which is about 66 feet square 
or about a tenth of an acre in size, and then sweep those grids that we lay out with a metal detector, sur metal detector survey, and wherever we come across a signal, excavate it to see whether or not we have 20th century debris that's in, out in the woods, or we're finding uh, historic artifacts. And if you think about um, what you'd find if you were looking at, um, at uh, you know, looking for artifacts with a metal detector, what do you think the most common artifact you'd find would be? Especially with a building that decay, you know, uh, decays and, and falls into the ground. Nails. Yeah, nails. Nails are, are what, what metal detectors call Montpelier gold. They're basically how we find all these, these sites of labor and all these buildings. And what's great about nails is, is that for metal detectorists, you know, and they, for a lot of metal detectorists, we, we do these metal detector programs at Montpelier. They're expecting to do surveys and locating buckles and coins and buttons. And when they hear what they're going to be finding 95% of the time is nails, they just kind of groom because these are the things they usually throw away when they do a metal detector survey. But when they learn that what nails do is not only give you an idea where the buildings are, but they actually allow you to date the building because nails go through about three different manufacturer changes from the 1760s, shortly before the American Revolution, through the 1840s. So each of these generational changes we were just talking about, like with the parents' generation and the grandmother's generation, those nails are all what we call hand forged nails. These um, rose head or handmade nails, they have, and Mary's gonna go into this into detail with you on Monday, but they're basically made from nail stock. Each individual one is made by hand. In the 1790s, what, you, what the nail manufacturer changes to is machine cut nails that allows much more mass manufacture of nails to be uh, carried out. And this um, machine-made nail manufacturer changes very rapidly in the 1790s into the 18-teens when Dolly and James Madison, you know, arranged for all these changes, not only to the main house, but to the larger plantation. And one, one nail that is my favorite nail type is this machine-cut nail that either, either has a hand-forged head or a hand-forged tip because they're exclusive to when James Madison Jr., the future president, begins changing the, um, the agricultural operations of the plantation and basically turns what his parents have set up on its head and moves all the buildings around across all the 2,650 acres at Montpelier. So basically, we're surveying a, what turns out to be a barn site out in the middle of the woods where there's, we find a bunch of square nails by finding these machine cut L, L or, or spatula or pointed tip nails dating from the 1790s, we know we're dealing with a barn that was uh, built there based on changes that President Madison was making in the 1790s. So we're able to tie these buildings to these changes that happen on the landscape. And uh, you see, you got um, someone. Oh, uh, Bashir, you said. Uh, uh, Loving it, yeah. I'm sure you're talking about the nails there. We, we love the nails oh, yeah, as well. This, but I could tell from the tip of it that it was hand nailed, and it's just interesting. That's all. This is all new to me, so I'm just taking notes. So that's all. Well, you were when you find the nails out of the site, you all are going to love them because the nails are just exceptionally well preserved. And we're actually one of the one of the areas we're excavating is a built is a shed that burned. And the nails look like they were made yesterday. They're in perfect condition. So you can see these manufacturing details in the nails as you find them in the ground. And it makes the, the nails, you know, what goes from just a ho-hum artifact into this, this incredibly powerful artifact that you're actually, it's, I'd say nails are what gives us the ability to witness in the enslaved Americans' activities more than any other, any other um, uh, artifact that we find at Montpelier. And so with these nails, what we're able to do is not only date sites and locate them, but when you start looking at the patterns of what we find with these metal detector surveys, is the, these charts that we have on the landscape of these different you know, ranges of hits, everything from zero to four hits up to 100 hits, this, at each one of these uh, 20 meter grids, we do a total hit count of how many artifacts, historic artifacts we find. And then you begin to be able to see concentrations of artifacts. And when you zoom in on this map, what you can see is 
where these sites are. So for example, this is the field quarter. You've got the blacksmith shop up here, tobacco barn over here. And then what we do is once we find these sites, not only we're able to date them based on the nails we find, but then when we've found the sites on the 20 meter grid, then we go in and lay in a 10 foot grid over these concentrations. And then all of a sudden you go from just finding the sites to actually finding, figuring out where the buildings are. So, so for example, up here at the overseer's house, you go from this much broader survey where you really can't tell where everything is. Remember, this is 66 feet. So this is, you know, 60, 120, 180, 200 feet distance here. Wouldn't really know where to put in a five by five unit. But once you start doing the 10 foot survey, you go from this very pixelated image of the this map distribution to this much more refined image of where the actual structures are. And then all of a sudden, we begin to know where, to, where the building sat so we can put in our excavation units. And so with the blacksmith shop, which is right in this area, uh, we've um, actually, if you look at, I've got a, a map and I'll send you the link for this map um, uh, after the, uh, the, um, the PowerPoint here. Let me see, I've got the, um, this map right here is the same map that I was just showing um, in the PowerPoint, but this is in GIS. This is like a live map that shows our current metal detector surveys. And in this case, what you can see is all these little squares, you know, to get you oriented again, here, uh, the visitor center is up in this area is right here. Here's the parking lot, overseer's house right here. The blacksmith shop is all this area in red here. And when you zoom in, you can see where all this red concentration of nails are. And this not only includes nails, but also slag and uh, clipped iron. This is where we've placed all these units. And we've actually found two other buildings here and down here where these uh, concentrations are almost exclusively nails. And so what we're beginning to develop is an idea that this blacksmith shop is made up of a probably you know four to five buildings in addition to areas we haven't even explored yet. And so when you go back to, let's see, get back to the PowerPoint here, what we're doing with, with these, uh, these metal detector surveys is going from the metal detector survey in the case, in this case, this is a survey of what is the tobacco barn that uh, Terry will take you to tomorrow or, or on Monday, is we go from this metal detector survey, what we think was a barn, we're not sure what it was, to actually being able to understand where these concentration of items are, and then begin to open up units. And what we found at this tobacco barn is we found the reason why we know it's a tobacco barn is we started finding all these areas where we were finding these charred uh, trenches that turn out to be these trenches used for smoking tobacco in the late 18th century inside this building that looks something like this. It was this three base structure. And then in the middle of this building, what we found was a threshing machine that dated to the, um, the 18 teens that showed us this barn went from being a tobacco barn in the 18 teens into a threshing barn. And it's right in the middle of this farm complex that's just down the hill from the visitor center. So all of a sudden, you know, we began to realize that this wasn't just an empty field but it was this quasi-industrial area and agricultural focus in the early 19th century that really bore witness to all the, uh, basically the, the hub of activity that took place within the core of the, um, of the farm was just down the hill from where people park their car today. So we've you know, really been, we discovered these sites about 10 years ago and we spent the past 10 years analyzing them to be able to understand what was here and developing these 3D conceptual maps of what we think this area is. And about two years ago, we received an NEH grant to do a study of this entire area. So what we've been doing over the past year is doing these 10 foot metal detector surveys to locate where these buildings are, and then coming in to do the excavations with the, our five foot by five foot units to see what we're finding through metal detector survey through shovel test pit survey and then through other remote sensing uh, techniques that we'll talk about with you all uh, next week. But essentially what you all are gonna be involved in next week is 
exploring these areas through these five by five units to understand all of the areas that, that Dennis has found through these metal detector surveys. And the metal detector surveys at the blacksmith shop, what, we're, what Dennis found, who was our metal detectorist, is he found these massive concentrations of not just clipped iron from the blacksmith production, but also um, horseshoe nails, horseshoes, that all speak to this blacksmith operation being a place where they're not necessarily manufacturing new tools for sale to the local community, but they're more repairing items for the farm in the 18 teens, 20s, and 30s. And it really shows how the blacksmith production changes from the 18th century into the early 19th century. And we'll talk about more about with this with you um, uh, 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 early next week when we get into some of these excavations. But just to give you an understanding of what you all will be doing next week is the units you're going to be working in are these five by five units, these five foot by five foot units. And we're going to have you excavating the layers, going down layer by layer, doing understanding how we record um, not just the items we find, but also the soil textures how we keep all the artifacts that we find from each layer within the unit separate and able to be identified for later analysis. And then also importantly about the artifacts themselves and the stories they tell about, you know, the labor and the work that was happening in this case at the blacksmith shop. And actually, if you followed, uh, if you follow our Instagram page, uh, which is the uh, uh, Montpelier archeology, span we found um, domestic items at the blacksmith shop that's making us, you know, really even begin to rethink what was at the blacksmith shop, whether the blacksmith might have been living there, it's hard to say, but th these initial explorations were, you all are going to be working in units that basically you're the first person to recover these artifacts. And what it gives us is every unit we open, we're understanding, we're basically developing even, you know, more and more questions about the site as we go. So it's a really exciting time to be, um, to be at the site. And let me, I'm going to stop sharing here so we can um, uh, see if y'all have any questions or, um, and begin to begin to, to wrap this up. But, but I wanted to give you all a sense of, you know, what um, y'all are going to be doing next week, how it fits into the, the larger history and the kind of questions we're asking about the landscape of Montpelier. And also to give you a way to go back and look at some of the documents that we sent you all. And one of the ones, um, there are two story maps that, um, that uh, Sarah Lee sent out. One was on the home farm. That's the area you're gonna be working on next week. But the other one is on the East Woods, which are these sites of labor that are, they're woods today, but were fields in the past that really give a different sense of what Montpelier is today as compared to what it was 200 years ago and how we can use this space with, with visitors today to tell this broader story. So, and also given that you all are teachers and what Dr. Jones is gonna be working with you all is how to bring these stories to life in the classroom. And what we wanna do is you know, this week when you're preparing for you know, being on site is think about the kind of resources that we've got at Montpelier, you know, whether it be photographs, some of the GIS maps that you all think you might be able to use in your own classroom or just, you know, your own curiosity, because obviously that's what you bring into the classroom is what your interests are, is, you know, try to be, um, uh, you know, uh, thoughtful in terms of what you'd want to get out of the week, what kind of information you'd like to, you know, walk away with on Friday of next week that you'll be able to um, you know, use in the classroom to, um, to tell some of these broader stories. So, and one thing we're gonna be engaging with you all next week is a lot more conversation. I, I was more of an auctioneer tonight, just rattling off uh, the, these, uh, the history and the ideas here and trying to cram it into an hour and almost kept it within an hour, but um, I always spill over a little bit. But wanted to open it up to any kind of questions you all might have, you know, whether it be about what we we're talking about tonight or just what to expect next week or, you know, information you'd want us to send you, um, you know, before your arrival. And Alex, Dr. Jones, is there anything you'd want to Yeah, add? I was going to jump in because I see y'all are like my students when I teach. They just don't say anything <laughs> and they stare and hope that you'll stop talking. 
<laughs> so well, really that's quick. my objective, Alex, is to stop talking to you. <laughs> so really quick, um, I just kind of want to do a quick roll call and see what everybody's mm. uh, subject matter is that uh, you teach. Um, if you don't want to actually yell it out, you can put it in the chat. It's, it's whatever you feel most comfortable with. Um, but I was just trying to I, I like to get an idea for the full gamut um, of what I'm working with when we do, because I try to tailor the lesson plans in between all of the different subjects. So Mike and Taylor, you're unmuted. So I'm assuming you're just gonna yell out. Hey, you... I'm gonna yell out uh, AP, <laughs> AP US history. And I'm also our mm -hmm. campus historian. Awesome. Uh, we have a campus yeah. that's built on top of a, a 19th century plantation. Okay. Oh, Mike, if you could send information on that, I'm dying of curiosity here. So oh, I, I, I could de definitely do that. <laughs> All right. So I see theater arts and then Taylor. I can't hear you at all. You can just put it in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> Brian. Eighth grade civics. Awesome. Okay. And chance. <laughs> um, I was eighth grade English and social studies, which is early U.S. history in Mississippi. But I just found out a few days ago that I'm probably going to be teaching public speaking and debate. So uh, for the high school. So I'm not really sure at the moment. Um, hopefully I can get my social studies <laughs> back at some point. But they've booted me to English right now. OK, OK. Awesome. Well, that was it. That was my only like quickie kind of question because um, I like to make everything applicable. I like to have it's we go over general lessons and just to kind of give you an idea what our afternoons will be like, we go over very, very broad, bare bone lesson plans. And then what we sit and do is I tailor it to the different subject matter. So I tell you how you can utilize this kind of skeleton and how you can utilize this model. I even make it work for math teachers. So I was just wondering if we had any mathematicians this go around. Um, but I like to tailor the different ones on how to think about it, how to handle it. Um, so I like when we have the arts integrated. Um, I like also thinking about um, helping you partner with other teachers as well. So how you can take two disciplines and pull them together in order to do a project. Cause I know some schools are really big on that. And some teachers are able to find awesome grants <laughs> to then help this along um, as well. So um, that was it. I look forward to hanging out with all of you next week. Um, I'm excited. Yeah, it's, thanks for asking that Dr. Jones that it, seeing all the different uh, subjects that y'all are involved in. That's, that's, uh, that's, that's very cool. And w one thing we'll, um, also uh, uh, talk about is, you know, what, you know, being on a, um, on a plantation and what that entails in terms of, you know, your own, your own energy and what, what, what that, what that, you know, living and, and uh, doing work on a plantation for a week is something that um, is, uh, is something that not everybody has done. And it's something that we take very seriously. So we're um, looking forward to having conversations about anything you all are interested in. That's one thing that we have uh, really uh, focused on over the past three or four years, especially with the, uh, the new exhibit we developed with the uh, descendant community at Montpelier, is the how, how to engage in conversations about hard history and meet people where they're at. And that's something that as teachers, you all do every single day and that's something that you know draw a lot of inspiration from and the teacher programs in the past you know uh, uh our you know, the archaeology staff has learned as much as you all have from you know doing the archaeology is how to how to speak and talk to folks so really appreciate that i will throw one thing else out it's a little bit more off topic but a more uh, a little bit more fun um just really quick make <laughs> sure you google all of the things to do um, before you come next week, just to know times, we had, there's a lot of nice wineries around, but they close at like five or six. Uh, so if you do want to go and visit one, you may have to think about like 
shooting straight from like Mount Pillar over to one, but they're all within like 20 or 30 minute distance. Um, Charlottesville for dinner. And then I don't know if they'll have it this summer just because of COVID, but the Shakespeare Theater, I don't know if they're doing, mm. but they have Shakespeare outdoors. Um, and it's pretty awesome. And I figured because it's outdoors, they may still be doing it. Um, but I would look all of those little things up just to see if there's anything you want to do in the evening um, as well, just to kind of plan ahead. Because normally, at least without fail, I will get together. I'm normally the person who lives with all the teachers and like we try and plan one night, but it's like a mad dash to go do something. So I just thought I'd throw that out there food for thought ahead of time. So. And if anybody wants some, some nerd fun, uh, I am planning, because it's only 30 to 45 minutes away, to, based on how I drive, uh, <laughs> to hit the wilderness in Spotsylvania. Um, my wife's great-great-grandfather was in the, the McGowan's Brigade that camped from December of 63 to May of 64 at Montpelier. So... Uh, I'm, I'm, not only, I'm really excited about going down to see the Civil War encampment, but I'm planning to jump over to the Wilderness or Spotsylvania, and, and any and everybody's invited if you want to go. That's amazing, Mike. I, I'll uh, I'll send you some of the um, articles written written on the encampments. Oh, and if your that. wife has any letters from her ancestors, uh, we, we, let we, me know. We, so far, we have not found them, but but he was in a 13th South Carolina part of McGowan's brigade, and he actually joins the unit in mid-December at Montpelier. So we do know that. Oh, wow. Okay. Wow. Yeah, lots to talk about. It, mm. Chris is going to have fun with uh, Chris uh, Pash does the uh, tour of the Civil War encampment, and uh, there's... Um, yeah, I have a lot to talk about with all that. That's cool. Thanks for letting us know that. Yeah. All right. Well, that's all I had. I'll let y'all go. I won't hold you up no longer. <laughs> I'm sorry. I do have a few questions. I was going to just wait till the very end so that everybody else could leave because I don't want to hold anybody longer than they want to. It's, a, it's travel questions. So I think since I'm from Mississippi, I don't know if anybody else is driving or has a long drive, but like on the way back, like after the uh, when the week's over on Friday, I've got a few questions about that, but I was going to let everybody else go before. You, you free to go. Yeah. That was it. <laughs> yeah, it might be interesting for other folks too. Okay. Yeah, good. Well, chance. Okay, so on Friday, what I know the schedule, and we're going to get a finalized schedule on Monday uh, for what the rest of the week looks like, but about what time will we finish up on Friday? We should be finishing up on Friday around four o'clock because uh, Alex, you probably know that we, we're doing the reception at three o'clock. Mm -hmm. And I think that that we're going to, um, uh, it'll be a pretty hard end at four o'clock. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. And then um, like, what else are we planning on doing Friday? Like as far as during the day before that, the same schedule typically or, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it'll um, essentially on Friday, it's, it's go out to the field, we still get together and do a short lecture, then we have kind of a round table moment um, in the reception. So it's a lighter day, but it's essentially the same day where we're still covering um, everything that you normally would do, just okay. kind of abbreviate it. All right, sounds good. Was that it? Cool. That was it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, if anybody has any questions, feel free to um, email uh, Dr. Jones, myself, or Sarah Lee. Y'all have been um, uh, getting information from her. And uh, we'll send uh, a final email out. Sarah Lee will um, uh, later this week with the recording of, the, um, of tonight's lecture and then some other resources that y'all would find useful. So, but looking forward to seeing you all and safe travels to uh, Montpelier. And, don't hesitate to, uh, we'll, we'll put our, our uh, cell phones in there as well in case somebody gets turned around uh, uh, getting onto the property. All right. Well, be safe, you all. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. All right.